In the not too distant future, there will be two screaming V12s on the market. There will be the 6.5 litre engine in the Aston Martin Valkyrie. <laughs> and the 3.9 litre in the Gordon Murray T50 fan car. What a prospect that thing is, a V12 manual fan car. Anyway, these engines hark back to the glory days of naturally aspirated Formula One, so you could be forgiven for thinking that it's remarkable that V12 engines like those can exist in this day and age of emissions, congestion zones and electrification. But there is a way to develop a V12 engine without getting in trouble with the regulations and it starts with something much more humble, a tiny inline 3. Let me explain. When you break down a big engine, you can look at the cylinder layout and the firing order to dissect it down to its fundamentals. If you look at the cylinder layer of a V12, you can check the firing order and you will see that it resembles two straight sixes joined together onto a common crank. Then you can look at a straight six and see that it resembles two inline threes with one turned around from the other. That means that once you have your little inline three engine, you have a quarter of a V12. So once you've nailed down everything with that tiny little engine, you're well on the way to multiplying it by four and getting your full V12. Nowadays, there's so much pressure on economy and emissions that before you start designing a whole engine, you have to nail down a combustion system, essentially sorting out the chemistry to make sure you're meeting those regulations. Back in the day, if you knew the layout, displacement, and the amount of power you were looking to achieve, Companies like Cosworth and Judd could go away and do some relatively simple calculations and then use principles of configuration and engine balancing to come up with a worthy engine. Now you have to work out exactly how the bang part of your four stroke cycle is going to work through the design of the chamber shape, the piston crown shape, your valve angles, your injector targeting, your compression ratio, your piston ring height, to then give you the numbers you need to tick that regulations box. Only then can you move forward with the rest of the engine. All of these factors are now absolutely critical to achieving performance, economy and half decent emissions. They always were important, but they are now at the forefront of decision making when designing an engine. Let's take the Valkyrie engine as an example. Aston came to Cosworth with a brief. Customers wanted a V12, it had to create a hypercar power figure and Adrian Newey pressed home that it had to be naturally aspirated. He didn't want any turbocharging gubbins getting in the way of his aero. Creating massive power with no boost is one thing, but how about the engine also having to meet EU emission regulations for a road car? If the engine couldn't pass those tests, there would be no Valkyrie, it would simply be another concept car that would never make it to production. So where did Cosworth start? Well, you have to hop back to 2014, when another manufacturer, Nissan, came to Cosworth and asked for an engine for its LMP1 car for 2015. The project timeline was so tight that they couldn't start from scratch, so Cosworth went away and tried to find a decent starting point. Luckily, they had just come out of the Jaguar CX-75 program. Now, I realise I talk about this car a lot, but it just seems to pop up everywhere. It had such an impact on the car industry that it seems to have influenced so many companies. Anyway, it had a screamer of a four-cylinder engine that was touted to be full of F1 tech. It was built to deal with massive cylinder pressures and the inline external arrangement of the pumps made it very flexible, quite like a racing engine. It turned out to be an ideal base from which Cosworth could adapt from. Nissan wanted a V6, so Cosworth took the Jaguar four-cylinder, cut a cylinder off to make it a three-cylinder, put an inline three head on the top and an inline three crank in the bottom and got testing. Cosworth managed to get a Le Mans combustion system working in exactly the way they wanted to, testing the engine at different loads and at different speeds, all using that little three-cylinder engine. Another team was working on the bottom end of the V6 and the whole project came together incredibly efficiently 
and the correlation was startling. The V6 didn't create double the power of the inline 3, it created more than double the power. The Nissan LMP1 project was not a success, but the engine was an absolute peach. It took just five months to get that mule engine working and to prove the concept, rather than 13 to 14 months to develop an entire V6 and then find out whether you'd hit the numbers or not. Hop a couple of years on and Aston come to Cosworth for the Valkyrie project and the decision is made to do the exact same thing, starting with that inline three cylinder mule engine. Now I will get in trouble from Cosworth for stating exactly the origin of the Valkyrie engine of that V12, but if you go back through exactly what I've said, you can join the dots and find the genesis of the V12 engines that are about to come out. I'll get in trouble if I say exactly a certain word order and go through the timeline, but you guys are smart enough, you can figure it out. But for me, the great thing about how the Valkyrie V12 engine can be broken down is that it is doubly symmetrical, so you can chop it into four equal parts. That means that you can essentially develop the full engine through one of the tiny mules. Let's go back to the two objectives that were given by Aston to Cosworth, high power and clean emissions. To get high specific power, that's all about breathing and getting the best airflow through the entire engine block as possible. And clean emissions is all about getting turbulent airflow within the combustion chamber, accelerating combustion speeds. This is where the three cylinder engine came into its own as a development tool. Not only could you sort out the combustion system at the top of the engine, making sure that you're getting the performance and the economy figures from it, but the V12 engine also had four different cats, meaning that each set of three cylinders had its own catalytic converter. That's really nice because that means you can sort out the engine's full exhaust system and make sure that it's giving you the right emission numbers to make it road legal, the main factor to get the hypercar onto the road. In no time at all in engineering terms, Cosworth had a quarter of a V12 that was ticking all the regulation boxes, giving the engineers the go ahead to start multiplying from three to 12. The power correlation, it couldn't have gone much better. The three cylinder test mule created 240 brake horsepower, actually slightly more than Cosworth thought they were going to create. Once you multiply that up, like the Nissan engine, it created more than four times that amount. The full 6.5 litre unit became the 1000 brake horsepower engine that we know today. The slight power bump happens because the cam gears and the pump configuration doesn't change much from inline 3 to V12 meaning less power is lost through parasitic losses to run those things when you have 12 cylinders instead of just three, despite the increase of frictional losses by having 12 pistons. There's also a benefit when it comes to the emissions correlation. If you combine the exhaust gases from one inline three with the inline three below it, you actually get a beneficial effect from the pulsations that reduces the emissions coming out of the exhaust pipe. So in both power and emissions, you see an improvement when you multiply up an engine, which is all down to that nailed down combustion system up top. Once that three cylinder engine comes up with the goods, you can then set about sorting out the fundamental geometry of your full engine. For example, the Valkyries V12 has an angle of 65 degrees. Now that's not actually ideal for a perfect balance in a V12, that would be 60 degrees. But 65 degrees was engineered into the design so that they could fit all the fancy carbon fibre intake gubbins in the top of the V and so it would clear Adrian Newey's beloved Venturi tunnel. So to summarise, you can start with an inline three, double it to become a straight six, and then have two straight sixes connected onto a common crank to form a V12. That means you can fully develop a little three cylinder engine, get all the numbers that you want to achieve, and then multiply it up into a V12. I've been chatting to the people at Cosworth and they're happy to have us at the factory to check out these tiny little mule engines, 
to see how they work and also how they lay the foundations for crazy engines like this. What is much cooler than a 240 brake horsepower naturally aspirated three cylinder engine that revs to 12,000 RPM? Editor, cue the sound clip again. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Drive Tribe.